in the scenario i have another 1 million surgery uh, done at arvind eye hospital again they have also concluded that it is even better in sics also where we make a bigger tunnel it's about four fold reduction that is what we achieve with intracameral antibiotics now is the risk of injecting an antibiotic into the eye to prevent end of thalmitis is worth the reduction of risk absolutely yes so here we are talking about the direct intracameral injection which has got several advantages we are talking about the minimal inhibitory concentration the peak antibiotic level that is achieved that is a cmax higher cmax over mic maximizes your bactericidal effect and the various pharmacokinetic studies also highlighted that when you study the area under the curve versus mic ratio delays the bacterial resistance and what about topical and intracameral for example in this case in this we have compared the moxifloxacin which is the commonly used uh, drug regimen when you use one drop four times daily which is a common regimen that we follow that achieves a, a concentration of about 1.9 micrograms in aqueous humor whereas if you use just 0.05 ml of moxifloxacin that has achieves a concentration of about 1250 micrograms uh, in aqueous humor and when you compare the minimal bactericidal concentration that is required to kill the microbes the common causative agents in your infective end of thalmitis we almost achieve 100 to 500 fold what is required is what we achieve here with moxifloxacin now what about side effects the safety of moxifloxacin have been well studied and well documented even with octs and your spms so it's not a, a, it is a very safe drug in fact and there are uh, concerns with dilutions and contaminants but we are coming up with pre packed drugs which will uh, fix this problem and what about cost effectiveness it is cost effective because the we incur significant expenses with end of thalmitis in treating end of thalmitis whereas we in fact save money with using uh, intracameral antibiotics there is a study quoting that the cost of administering this drug is just about 9.5 rupees per patient whereas the cost of treating this patients the end of thalmitis would be much more higher here you are talking about the safety of the patient and you can't just say that i am really bad at making decisions i think dr tamil you should reconsider and start using intracameral antibiotics to conclude we have enough support from the literature and they all lend irrefutable support to the value of intracameral antibiotics injected at the end of cataract surgery it is definitely yes yes and yes to antibiotics do you still want to talk dr tamil uh, good afternoon everyone uh, yes i still want to talk dr vidya and is a no no for intracameral antibiotics a word of caution don't blindly believe what have been told for the past 5 minutes we all know effective end of thalmitis prophylaxis is a rising global imperative recently there is more interest among cataract surgeons like dr vidya regarding the use of intracameral antibiotics it is important to be aware of the published evidence to make this important decision coming to the evidence and adoption the highest quality evidence comes from randomized clinical trials and only rct we have is the esr study which is conducted in 2007 and it has been critically evaluated for the high rate of end of thalmitis that is 0.3% in the control group and having used cefiroxime because it doesn't give a vast coverage for gram negative organism like pseudomonas aeruginosa and multiple study centers have been involved and few of the centers have used cleroconine incisions and we all know there are striking global differences in the prevalence of end of thalmitis and differences in the causative organisms and the antibiotic sensitivity profiles so a direct comparison between different report of end of thalmitis rate is not always possible and we cannot adapt it in spite of the study being published in 2007 and in spite of commercially available cefiroxime still one fourth of the respondents has not included this in the esrs survey report coming to the big data studies most of them are retrospective so they have multiple covariables which could influence the results there are potential inaccuracies in diagnosis and procedure coding and when we look into the time frame it took multiple years for this study to generate a sizable patient volume approaching so there could be different techniques and surgeons involved which could affect the end of thalmitis rate coming to the indian study which is published which was done on the charity patients and it states clearly states the question of whether intracameral moxifloxacin is effective for reducing end of thalmitis with phaco was not directly answered 
And the second study which analyzed 6 lakh surgeries acknowledges that the study does not constitute level 1 evidence. However, there is no consensus that intracameral antibiotic prophylaxis should be the standard of care. Now, Dr. Vidya have the courage to face the truth. Coming to the safety aspects. And we all know there is no commercially available cefiroxim in most of the country except in Europe. And there is risk of introducing contaminants and adjuvants due to compounding and there is always a risk of dosing errors. 5% of the patients shows cross-reactivity to cephalosporin and there have been reports of anaphylaxis. The prophylactic use of ancomycin has been discouraged because it has been res uh, reserved for gram-positive uh, organisms like MRSA. And we are all very aware of hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis which has been reported with vancomycin. And to, to the surprise, this is the most common antibiotic which has been used in 2014 ASCRS survey. This has been associated with uniformly poor outcome and bilateral risks. Every single case occurred after uncomplicated cataract surgery with intraocular vancomycin was administered. We all know systemic moxifloxacin has been associated with Bait-like syndrome occasionally. Bait is like bilateral acute iris transillumination defect. And this is the recent case report in 2019. After intracameral moxifloxacin, three weeks later, there has been acute pigment dispersion with elevated IOP, which is not controlled with maximum anti-glaucoma medications, AC wash, goniotomy, and it required trabaculectomy to bring back the IOP to normal. The cost, when we look into the number to treat analysis, in order to avoid one case of endophthalmitis, we have to approximately treat 2,500 to 5,000 cases for this prevention. Drug resistance is an important clinical challenge and widespread use of intracameral antibiotic is contrary to the basic thesis of antibiotic stewardship. The Sweden surgeons were the first one to implement the intracameral antibiotic usage and this is the data from Swedish National Cataract Surgery database. When they looked into the microbiology profile of the antibiotic causality organisms now, and there, is, there has been an increase in number of enterobacter species causing the endophthalmitis. And this enterobacter is resistant to cefiroxime already and it, these patients are associated with worse visual outcomes. The only level, one, level 2 evidence is there for providin iodine and to the surprise, only 84% of the Indian ophthalmologists are using it in their recent a AOA survey. This should be increased. So, think about the perceived lack of evidence supporting this method. We already have a low baseline rate of endophthalmitis even without intracameral antibiotics. The safety and issues around the optimal antibiotic stewardship. So, surgeons wishing to improve their endophthalmic rate should carefully assess all aspects of the op operating room preparation and the sterile technique. So, it's definitely a no. The use of intracameral antibiotics should not be considered a standard of care. And the value of this strategy remains uncertain on the basis of currently available data. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Vidya and Tabriza Singh. Both of you have put your point so well that I think we are confused now what to do. Should we or should we not? You know, what is the opinion of the audience? Could anybody, you know, uh, highlight on this? Do you have any... Anybody know wants to say some anything? You should use it, yeah. Yeah. We cannot we cannot take the chance of you know uh, losing an eye, you know, at the cost of not using any antibiotics. Absolutely, absolutely. Because this is, yeah, because it, this end of thermitis is a, a real emergency and uh, we can't afford to lose the eye just because we have not used the antibiotics. So I think, uh, I don't know what is the opinion of uh, the other, uh, you know, uh, people who are on the dais. I personally feel that we should use antibiotics so that we don't lose the eye. I think we should be more specific. Yeah. So, moxiflexacin, intracameral should be uh, should be advocated that's right. what i mean to say right. not the other because in, in the, uh, the discussion it was vancomycin cefiroxime yeah. and so these are not the antibiotics which can be used largely and whatever studies have been done in recent past uh, which is on the large six lakh patient i think we should be more specific intracameral use of moxifloxacin at the end of the surgery of all the surgery even glaucoma surgery 
not the retina, but glaucoma surgery should be advocated. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I would call upon the next speaker. Uh, tips for optical outcomes in the event of such a disaster. Thank you, ma'am. Respected teachers, senior and ophthalmologists, my dear friends. So I'll just go on an overview about both. Uh, I'll start off with TAS because that is also a very important subject here because most of us get confused at that stage itself. So these are the contents I'm just going to brief about. Maybe I will not be able to cover the entire spectrum in seven minutes, but I'll try to do the best. So as far as the definition, if you know this definition, it covers it all. TAS is actually, this is sterile. It is non-infectious. It happens in the acute post-operative period, affects only the anterior segment, and it is caused by non-infectious substances that enter the anterior segment, result in toxic damage to intraocular tissues. So the definition itself says it all. So what causes it if you ask anything that you use intraocularly in your surgical procedures, whether it is glaucoma surgery like surgery or cataract surgery or retina surgery can induce TAS. So it uh, has a wide gamut of things that can actually cause TAS. So there are certain things that we do not even look upon like a simple paracane drops like how many of us actually pay attention to when it was opened. So certain small things that I learned to us nowadays, they write the date on that or at least dispose the drops on an everyday basis. So these are small things that help you avoid it. And one more point is I've seen most surgeons put paracane during intraoperative period when the patient uh, complains of pain. The pain intraoperatively is more because of the Irish tube or the high bottle head that is causing it and putting a topical paracane at that time is not going to help the patient because you're already put paracane 10 minutes before the surgery. So anything, the viscoelastic agent, that is why for the NABS it's very important that you make sure which batch you're using and the which company you're using. Don't keep changing the company too often and don't try new companies which you're not familiar with or have a good track record that can support you when such a disaster happens. And also the intraocular companies because nowadays we see a huge market of intraocular companies and viscoelastics. The other things that are already present in our hospital, yes, the tubings that we use, we're all slowly moving towards the... Uh, the, from the recycled ones to the day-to-day uh, -day practice but still all of us use the re uh, reusable tubings so we should make sure those uh, denatured proteins that get caught in the tubes are not there because sometimes we see that can regurgitate into the anterior chamber what they mean by uh, denatured viscosurgical some of us when you inject the visco cannula after ETO, you see that small white foam like thing that comes out so these are all the substances that can actually end up causing tasks which we don't pay much attention to so we should make sure these cotton fibers, nowadays I think all of us use non-powdered gloves. So before when we were using powders gloves, that's why they used to wash it before the surgery. And all the enzymatic detergents that were used to clean the instruments, no longer all these things are used nowadays. So once you have a case like this with redness, congestion and hypopion, it's a scaring thing for all doctors. So again the key is to basics, again the good slit lamp examination because don't skip anything there because that can give you a clue. You have to measure the height of hypopion because that is when you are going to know if you treat the patient, the only basis you are going to treat is whether it is reducing or increasing. How is the fibrin in the anterior chamber? Is the pupil reacting or not? The membranes in the pupillary region. Then the fundus evaluation. It is always good to grade the fundus, make a drawing, whether you are able to see the disc or the vessels. So that is one more way of how you can evaluate whether your patient is improving over a period of time according to your treatment. The second most key important feature here is you go on to other instruments like the B-scan. So if you have a clinical scenario like this on the top and when you do a B scan you find that the posterior vitreous is not involved, I think 99.99 I still put like that percent it could be only TAS. So that is one of the most differentiating features from TAS and endophthalmitis. But then when you see a B scan like this, when you have these vitreous echoes, you can most definitely and 100% be sure it is endophthalmitis and the whole line of thinking and management should change and not to waste an hour saying let me just try him on drops, maybe he will be better. That is one more big ego that surgeons, we do not accept endophthalmitis very early and that is one of the major causes that the patient goes blind later on. So once we know it's endophthalmitis, I think it is very very important for the aqueous tap or a vitreous tap, depending if you are an anterior segment surgeon, you can always do an aqueous tap. One, it is very very important for medical legal purposes also. Whether you get a positive strain or not, it is documented, you have to do a tap and then send it for culture, for grams and KOH and note it down. So on a nutshell, these are the main differentiating features. TAS usually occurs in the immediate post-operative, it usually happens after the third day. And actually the cornea end to end you will see haziness in TAS. That is because there's lots of toxins that are released and that causes that haziness in the cornea. But actually in endophthalmitis is more localized areas are there. And one more thing, pupils are actually more fixed and dilated because of these toxic enzymes and TAS and there is some amount of reaction except for if there is too much of fibrin in endophthalmitis. And yes, the vitreous involvement in the two. 
as far as the task management goes it has to be steroids steroids so hourly steroids will be the first line of management cycloplegis yes to relieve the pain and to make sure there is no sinusoidal formation later on oral steroids is also something that i definitely give i know there is controversy about diabetic patients but these are the patients who actually have infections and so with the physician's opinion you can still start them on steroids a short course of steroids is not going to change the entire alter a 20 year old diabetic patient and the antibiotic eye drops that we close if you ask me any role for surgery yes there are very few cases what happens after the task is controlled you find sometimes this membranes that are there in the pupillary area that is causing defective vision so now the inflammation is controlled and after all the inflammation is controlled this is only two cases i have taken up like this in which you see that central fibrin that is there so it has to be broken and released if you want to have good visual recovery so you just go in and then remove these membranes and give it a good wash above and below in the capsular bag so there are certain situations like this where you will have to take the patient so i already discussed by the previous speakers that prevention is the best method so i think povidone avidone i think tumbler is told and still that is the gold standard the biggest mistake we do is we are in a hurry doing long hum cataracts so you want to put a drop and start immediately it doesn't work like that minimum is at least 5 minutes i think the recommendation is almost 10 minutes so that is when the coagulum forms so good draping simple things like this even preventing the hair that is coming forward you can have a tape there make the patient comfortable with the airway and a good beta den cleaning and wash and taping of the eyelashes also not to be in a hurry make sure the entire thing is covered that's the whole concept of draping so if you're going to have exposed areas like this and the mebone glands open and those hair uh, eyelashes peeking out so that can also increase two times the folds of the patient having end of the mitis and wound architecture is also a very very important wound burns or anything don't hesitate to put a suture so that is what i'm trying to say here so then one more small thing that we have taken up is weekly surgical meetings like how many of us actually analyze our cases because we are worried only when we have endophthalmitis so if you want to prevent endophthalmitis i say you should have weekly meetings in your hospital analyzing every case even if there is one case and of cataract who has a plus 2 intracellular inflammation that is different from your routine patients who do not have so these types of weekly meetings and recording even a smaller findings a small fibrin or something makes it very very important on a longer run so that is how on a long run you can actually have a lesser rate so then moving on to endophthalmitis yes what will you do i think the first thing is you should not worry because we are here the vr surgeons are here so don't worry because things have changed and the modality of treatment and you are getting better results so this one thing that i learned from my mentor mohan rajan is that the first golden hour because the initial delay that you do can actually affect the vision of the patient because you have to treat him like an emergency like any emergency in the icu like how madam said the first thing is you have to realize it is end of so either if you have the facilities please admit the patient and make it feel important to the patient that you are taking extra care for him explain it to him don't hide anything from him the patient that i treat end of the matter is still my loyal patient some have regained vision some have lost their vision become pl but the pl patients are more happy and they bring more relatives i don't know why but that is true when you be true to them that is when they are loyal to you start antibiotics immediately then take the ac tap and send it for culture to the labs the closest lab don't wait for the results depending on that you decide on what to inject most commonly it is going to be a gram negative gram positive so it will be vanco septa zidin whether the choice is between whether you want to inject steroids or not and then yes there is a role for vitrectomy also i'm not going into the details of all the medicines that are available in the dosages because even now we have a chart that is put up in all the wards in our hospital so so that's the best way to have it so that there's no confusion all the dilution factors also should be known intravitreal injections yes that is the second most important thing so this is one more method that developed actually when you want to do a vitreous tap we have this vitreous tap which is more effective than the anterior chamber tap this you could put a 25 gauge trocar so why we did this is instead of avoiding multiple injections the first time you can go on and actually do a vitreous tap with the cutter portable cutters which are available and then you start injecting the antibiotics so all this is done through one port and one this thing so you avoid multiple pricks to the patient so this is something that we presented in esr the technique to do when you are giving intravitreal injections this is how initially previously it was treated you had only 20 gauge vitrectomies so it did a ac maintainer and the whole concept that time was to do a core vitrectomy that is you are just trying to debulk and then come out and you used to say so that the antibiotics have a better effect and the load of the microorganisms are reduced so the whole this thing was only about core vitrectomy like you can see here with the 20 gauge gutters just going behind and doing a good core vitrectomy but then the last thing i'll just show you how things have changed this is my recent cases 
So nowadays it's all become sutureless 23 gauge vitrectomy and now it's no more core vitrectomy. We prefer to do a complete vitrectomy. In fact, you should do, be more cautious and do so you can see very clearly these vitreous exudates and these snowball pasties over the retina. Not my phone. So you can see, uh, we even do the, the trimming of the peripheral vitreous here that you can see here. We have very good systems. So you should examine the periphery for breaks and tags because initially you used to have patients developing RD later on. That is because the periphery is the area where usually these tags happen. So you should examine them clearly. I was not able to remove these things which are there on the retina. It was very strange for me. I haven't seen something like this before. So actually one of my fellow actually gave the idea to in open up the infusion actually. So once the infusion came, these uh, exudates and the snowball capacity started uh, moving around. And then again fluid gas exchange was done. And this is how the, the case ends. So what basically happened is because of the newer systems and newer advancements, you are able to get a very quiet eye like this even after vitrectomy. So no more the taboo of vitrectomy or losing patient is not there. So we do get very good results but if treated in a systematic linear fashion, drops, intravitreals and definitely the patient will require surgery. Even there is a coagulum formation, the inflammation is under control, we would still like to go inside and remove the coagulum that is there to actually give visual recovery to the patient. So no more it is only treating the inflammation but also for the visual recovery. This was the post-op on day 40 of the patient. It's having almost a normal macula, a normal thing and this was a patient who was a very uncontrolled diabetic patient which led to the infection in the first place. So we all want to talk about premium IOLs, we all want premium patients and we are all premium surgeons. So I think no more this is a challenge if treated properly. And then the proper workup and documentation is the key. Whether we do or not, at least the documentation should be there. That is what I have learned throughout my short career. We can get very successful outcomes. Thank you. I'd like to once again thank the entire team, Tamil Arasi and Vidya, who are my seniors in Arvind and I Foundation for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Uh, one thing I would like to add here is, you know, uh, I think everybody would agree with me that uh, whenever there is an infection like this detected early, it's always better to take a second opinion. Yes, ma and uh, we were taught, uh, you know, years back that whenever there is a case like this, you know, you have to give antibiotics from all the routes. IV, subconjunctival, local, topical, something like, you know, how you treat an ophthalmia and neonatorum, you know. I agree with both yeah. your points, actually. So, you know, so uh, with this wonderful session of endophthalmitis, I think uh, we come to the end of the session. I would like to call upon the next, uh, you know, uh, panelists who are here. Thank you. Thank you very much.